Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to outline an objection to moral realism, the arbitrariness objection. This is an objection that crops up in a few different ways, uh, but it's stated most plainly in the article Moral Realism and Arbitrariness by Jason Cowell. So I'll be following his presentation of the objection. Okay, moral realism. Uh, moral realism is the view that some moral judgments express propositions, some of these propositions are true, and these propositions are made true by stance-independent moral facts. The moral facts are discovered, not invented. Uh, the truth or falsehood of moral claims is determined by the moral facts. So, for instance, the moral realist might say that it is a fact that slavery is wrong, and this is not dependent on, uh, you know, what our beliefs about slavery happen to be. Even if, even if everybody believed that slavery was acceptable, slavery would still be wrong. We discovered that slavery is wrong, much as we discovered that water is H2O. That's the basic idea of moral realism. I won't spend too much time going into details. I have a whole series on meta-ethics, which you can check out if you want more there. Okay, so Cowell sets up the arbitrariness problem by drawing on a comparison with the euthyphro dilemma. Now, the euthyphro is a classic objection to divine command theory. Uh, divine command theory being the view that morality is determined by God's commands. So, according to divine command theory, what it means to say that giving to charity is good is that giving to charity is approved of by God. Uh, what it means to say that slavery is wrong, or what makes slavery wrong, is that God commands us not to enslave people. Um, so, so here's, here's a dilemma. Um, we can ask this question of, uh, you know, so we can ask the question, is a particular action morally right because God commands it? Or does God command the action because the action is morally right? Prima facie, the divine command theorist affirms the first option. What makes an action morally right is that God commands it. But in that case, there's this worrying arbitrariness in the moral facts. Um, slavery is wrong simply because God commands us not to enslave people, right? Slavery is wrong just because of what God says. But God could easily have commanded something else. God could have decided to command us to enslave people, in which case slavery would be acceptable. And it seems absurd that slavery would be acceptable just in virtue of the fact that God says something different about it. Um, now, of course, on the other hand, if the divine command theorist says that God commands a particular action because the action is right, so God commands us not to enslave people because, you know, respecting people's autonomy is the right thing to do independently of what God says, then, you know, the moral status of an action is fixed by something independent of God's commands. So, I mean, the youth of dilemma is that Either God, like, just chooses what's good and bad, in which case it's not clear why, why we should care <laughs> what God says. Uh, you know, like, why, why the hell would it matter what God's commands are? Um, or God is appealing to some independent standard of what is good or bad, in which case we're giving up on divine command theory. Um, or at least we seem to be giving up on divine command theory. Good and bad no longer depend on the commands of God. Um, so the important point, though, is this is, is like the first horn of the dilemma, right, where we where we just bluntly affirm that um, what makes a particular action right is that God commands it. And there's something worryingly arbitrary about that. Like it just doesn't it, it just doesn't seem like there's any particular reason why we should care what God's commands are. Um, OK, so what does all of this have to do with moral realism? Well, Cowell argues that realist moral facts uh, face this kind of arbitrariness problem. They are arbitrary in much the same way that the commands of God are arbitrary under the first horn of the euthyphro. Uh, so, as Cowell puts it, I quote, uh, The realist moral facts would be equally unexplained. No one chooses the moral facts, they simply appear as part of the world. Just as a god would have no reason for choosing norms, the universe would have no reason for choosing, as it were, the realist norms. Uh, the fundamental moral principles just are true, uh, basically. Like this, so this is the idea. Like there's nothing, there's nothing further that makes them true, um, and it's not at all clear 
why we should conform to them. So, to elaborate on this, in, in the case of divine command theory, the troubling question is, why should we act on God's commands? Why should we care about God's commands? Now, actually, the traditional theist does have an answer to this. We should care about God's commands because God is going to reward his followers and punish the sinners. OK, fair enough. Um, but that's just a question of prudence rather than morality. Um, put aside the question of reward and punishment, right? What's puzzling here is why should we align our values to the values of this supreme being? Right. So, like, let's say we discover that God commands us to enslave people. It's tempting to respond. OK, and so what? Like, I feel that slavery is appalling. I can recognise that God considers slavery acceptable and I can still feel that slavery is appalling. I can still campaign against slavery. I can discourage others from enslaving people. I can blame those who support slavery and praise those who object to it and so on. Right. Like I can have the belief that God commands us to enslave people, while at the same time just continuing to have exactly the same attitude as I always had to slavery. Um, now, of course, if God is going to punish those who object to slavery, then I guess, you know, that might be a, a relevant consideration. That might give me some prudential reason um, not to object to slavery. But, you know, again, it's not going to change my, my attitude. And why should it? Right. So, so, OK, God has a different attitude to slavery than I do. OK, so what? Um, I mean, you know, maybe a, a useful analogy here is suppose I discover that my neighbour Verity thinks that slavery is acceptable. Well, that just doesn't have any authority whatsoever over me. That doesn't give me any reason for accepting slavery. It, it, would, it seems like it would be completely arbitrary for me to hold that slavery is acceptable just because Verity thinks that slavery is acceptable. And the worry is that this same arbitrariness holds in the case of divine command theory. It would be arbitrary for me to hold that slavery is acceptable just because God says that slavery is acceptable. I, I have no reason for thinking that the ethical system that is commanded by God is any more choice worthy than any rival ethical system. That's the, the heart of the euthypro dilemma and, and the heart of this arbitrariness challenge. Now, Cowell argues that the same challenge is going to arise for moral realism in general, that any moral realist is going to face this kind of problem. So maybe one way to think about this is to consider an oracle, right? Like the oracle tells you the facts about the world. And this oracle has proven to be extremely reliable at telling us what the world is like. As far as we can tell, the oracle is literally omniscient. I guess we could actually just stipulate that for the purposes of a thought experiment that the oracle is indeed omniscient. But, but so far, this oracle has gotten absolutely nothing wrong. Then we ask the oracle about morality. And the oracle reveals that the moral realists are right. There really are objective moral facts. But it turns out that the moral facts are very different from what we expected. So maybe it turns out that suffering is good and slavery is permissible. Or maybe there are just like really weird moral rules. So, you know, maybe it turns out to be wrong to drink water from purple cups, right? Um, but the point is, is that, you know, we get some surprising results from the, uh, from the oracle. Now, the question is, would we choose to reorganize our society and our behavior so as to conform to the, ob to the objective moral facts that have been revealed by the oracle. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe not, but it certainly seems like I could, I could hold the belief that, say, slavery is objectively morally permissible, that it is an objective moral fact that slavery is permissible, right? I could hold that belief, but at the same time, I could continue to campaign against slavery, I could continue to blame those who support slavery and praise those who object to it. Uh, you know, I could continue trying to build a world in which slavery does not occur. Um, I could continue to feel that slavery is utterly repugnant. So basically, I could say, I, I don't care about these objective facts, right? I don't want a world where people are enslaved. Um, and so my belief about the objective moral facts need not make any difference to my behaviour. And... Nor is it obvious 
why it should make a difference to my behaviour. This is this is the worry. Um, I mean, clearly we can conceive of a variety of different moral systems. Uh, these systems will give us different accounts of what makes particular actions right or wrong, and they'll give different verdicts in specific cases. Now, as the realist sees it, one of these moral systems, one of these codes of conduct, correctly describes the moral facts. And so the question is, why should I care about that when I'm making decisions about how to act? maybe some alternative system is more closely aligned with the things that I care about. So let's say that the moral system is the system that correctly describes the objective moral facts. But then there's the schmoral system. Uh, the, schmoral, the schmoral system is the system that is most in line with whatever my values are. Um, and of course the, the schmoral system still provides true descriptions, it's just going to be true descriptions of my values and what's entailed by my values, as opposed to true descriptions of the objective moral facts. Okay, so why is the moral system more worthy of following than the schmoral system? Or indeed the schmoral star system, or the schmoral star star system, or any other system of conduct. Um, so, okay, the fact that Verity thinks that slavery is acceptable, that doesn't give me any reason for supporting slavery. The fact that God says that slavery is acceptable doesn't give me any reason for supporting slavery. Along the same lines, the idea is, well, if it turns out that slavery is, it's, if it turns out to be an objective fact that slavery is morally acceptable, it's not obvious why I, I should then start supporting slavery. Um, so we can maybe, you know, so, so let's say that, you know, somebody is trying to convince us to follow some, some set of rules, right? And we're asking the question, why, right? Why should I follow these rules? Okay, well, one answer is you should follow these rules because these are the rules favoured by your neighbour Verity. Okay, so what? Uh, well, you should follow these rules because these are the rules favoured by your culture. Again, so what? I mean, there might, there might be practical reasons to care about this. There might be practical reasons. The fact that your culture favours certain rules is going to be a relevant, you know, practical consideration. But I don't have to agree with what my culture says. OK, uh, why should I follow these rules? Well, because these are the rules that are commanded by God. OK, so what? I don't care what God says. Um, why should I follow these rules? Because these are the rules that are encoded in the objective moral facts. Yeah, OK, so what? Um, I mean, God's commands are at least <laughs> backed up by the promise of reward and the threat of punishment. The realists' moral facts don't even have that much to recommend them. Nothing stops us from acting according to some alternative code of conduct, so why shouldn't we, right? Like, we, we have a choice, okay? We can, we can act in accordance with the realists' moral facts or act in accordance with some alternative. Um, so if it turns out to be morally good to enslave people, I can just say, well... Yeah, but uh, I, I don't care about I don't care about morality then, right? Uh, it's schmorally bad to enslave people. The the schmoral rules the schmoral rules tell me not to enslave people, and I prefer schmorality, uh, even though schmorality does not track these objective facts. Um, I like the schmoral system. Okay, so. Um, a quick advert. If you like my channel, uh, you can support me on Patreon. I will be uploading bonus videos about once a week on Patreon. Uh, also a one-off donation on PayPal. Um, I offer private tutoring. Uh, I, I, I am fully qualified to do so. I have a PhD in philosophy, so if you're interested in private tutoring, send me an email. I also have a Discord. The link for all this stuff will be in the description. All right then, moving on. Um, okay, so I've explained the arbitrariness challenge. Um, now it's time to turn to some potential objections. So one sort of immediate objection is, well, you know, maybe there's just something kind of confused or incoherent about everything I've been saying so far, right? So so um, here's, here's one worry. If I'm a moral, let's say I'm a moral realist, and I believe that utilitarianism is objectively correct, okay? The moral facts are correctly described by utilitarianism. Well, in that case, 
I just am a utilitarian. Um, now, clearly, I can still fail to conform my behaviour to utilitarianism. In fact, probably I will fail to, to conform my behaviour to utilitarianism. But this is not surprising, right? So, I, I will sometimes fail to do what I morally ought to do. Yeah, I mean, all people are self-interested, all people are subject to weakness of the will, all people are sometimes irrational, uh, etc. People are motivated by all sorts of things beyond moral concerns. And nobody can force me to do what I morally ought to do. Um, okay, but so what? I, I morally ought to do it, right? I mean, so... Whether a given moral realist will conform to what they take to be the moral facts, that is a psychological question about that particular realist. There's, there's nothing of philosophical interest here. So, you know, the, the worry is, is that this arbitrariness challenge is trying to kind of construct a sort of a, a philosophical challenge out of a very trivial psychological fact, um, which is that, yeah, sometimes people are going to fail to act in ways that they think they morally ought to act. Um, okay, so, so I think what Cowell would say is that we can... What, what the arbitrariness challenge is appealing to is that I can recognise the realist's moral facts, or I can have beliefs about those moral facts without endorsing or taking on, as Cowell puts it, the moral standpoint. So, when I endorse a particular standpoint, uh, I will be concerned with, you know, the, the norms, and I will, I will make some attempt to guide my behaviour according to those norms. Uh, Cowell quotes David Kopp, um, so I take on a moral standpoint M, just in case, um, number one, I intend to conform to M and I am disposed to conform to M. Number two, I tend to have a favourable attitude towards myself and others for complying with M. Uh, number three, uh, I tend to have a negative response towards myself and a negative response to others if I fail to conform to M. Number four, uh, I regard failures as creating a presumption of liability to a negative response. Um, that's a that's slightly paraphrased, but that's that's the sort of idea, right? Like, so to endorse a moral standpoint involves allowing that standpoint to play a particular kind of role in practical deliberation right when you endorse when you endorse a moral standpoint you kind of use that standpoint in your decision making and you use that standpoint to sort of shape your own emotional dispositions now it does seem clear that i could hold the intellectual belief in you know, so I could I could believe that M correctly describes the moral facts, but then I can just not endorse M. I can just not care about it. Um, I could refuse to take on the moral standpoint, as it were. So again, like supposing that utilitarianism is the objectively correct moral system. Well, I want to have true beliefs, so I believe it's an objective fact that people morally ought to maximise happiness. I can hold this belief still not be concerned at all with maximising happiness. I can choose some other system to guide practical deliberation and to shape my emotional responses. Um, I can endorse a system that I recognise does not correctly describe the moral facts. Now, given factors like weakness of the will and irrationality, I probably won't conform perfectly to this system either, but I treat it as an ideal. So, there does appear to be a genuine question here, right? If the moral standpoint is determined by objective moral facts, okay, that still leaves me with the question of why take on the moral standpoint as opposed to some other standpoint? Um, so we might try appealing to metaphysics. We might say that the moral standpoint is metaphysically distinct. So maybe what makes the objective moral facts special what makes the objective moral facts, you know, choice worthy is that they have some distinct metaphysical features. Some philosophers argue that uh, moral properties are non-natural properties. 
it is a non-natural fact that slavery is wrong. The, the act of enslaving people has this special kind of non-natural property that supervenes on it that makes it wrong. Um, and although there are, of course, facts about what alternative codes of conduct will prescribe, these alternative codes of conduct fail to track the non-natural properties. Cowell gives the analogy that the moral facts have supervening halos, uh, while, you know, the facts about what the alternative systems prescribe, the, the schmoral facts and other types of facts, they don't have the halos. Um, okay, well, this kind of move seems, um, well, it runs into a fairly obvious problem, which is it just kind of pushes this arbitrariness challenge one step back. Um, why should I care about, say, the patterns of non-natural properties? Uh, this is only going to motivate me to care about the moral facts if I happen to already care about the patterns of non-natural properties or the patterns of halos or whatever. But again, this seems arbitrary. Um, indeed, we might as well say, returning to the euthyphro, that the moral facts are metaphysically distinctive because they are backed up by the commands of God. I mean, that would certainly make the moral facts special and distinctive in some sense. That would be a distinctive feature of them, right? The fact that God commands us to follow a particular rule, that is a distinctive feature of that rule. Even so, the mere fact that God commands something does not give me any reason to care about it. Um, and the worry is that the same is going to be the case for any other metaphysical distinction. Um, I can recognise the, the, the distinction, I can, I can like recognise that there are these non-natural properties, but then I can just say, yeah, I don't care about that. Um, all right then, another uh, objection or response to uh, this arbitrariness challenge appeals to the idea that the arbitrariness argument is, it involves a confusion about the meaning of normative terms like ought or should. So what we are asking when we forward this arbitrariness challenge is essentially the classic question of why be moral, right? Why ought we do what's moral? Why should we conform to morality rather than to some other way, you know, some other system? Now, there are two ways of interpreting this question. Either the ought is a moral ought or it's a different kind of ought. Now, if I ask the question, why morally ought I to do what's moral? Well, the answer is trivial. I morally ought to do what I morally ought to do. That's a logical triviality. Um, you know, so to say that slavery is morally wrong just is to say that you morally ought not to do it. Um, so, yeah, if you like, why morally ought I do uh, what's moral? Well, again, it's just it's just trivial, right? By contrast, maybe I'm asking uh, why I rationally ought to do what's moral. Um, and in that case, I'm looking for some non-moral justification of morality. Um, Carroll frames this problem in terms of giving a justification for taking up a normative standpoint. So let's say we try to justify endorsing some normative standpoint S. Well, we have two options. Um, we can give the justification from the standpoint itself or from some other standpoint. So let's say we postulate that there are objective moral facts. I can then ask, okay, why take up the moral standpoint? Um, like why endorse these objective moral facts? If we take the first option, then we would say, well, you know, because it's an objective fact that we morally ought to take up the moral standpoint, right? Like, why should I conform to the objective moral facts? Well, because that's what I objectively ought to do. <laughs> Uh, if we take the second option, then we would be saying that conforming to the objective moral facts is justified from some other standpoint. Maybe it's in my self-interest to conform to the objective moral facts, or, you know, maybe it follows from the nature of rationality or something like that. So let's take these one at a time. Um, the first option. So in this case, I try to justify the moral standpoint from the moral standpoint itself. Why should I care about the objective moral facts? Well, Again, it's trivial. I objectively, morally should do what I objectively, morally should do. Um, there's nothing more to be said there. But notice that there's a kind of symmetry here. So on the one hand, yeah, I mean, it's kind of trivial to say that I morally should do what I morally should do. But by the same token, we can say that I, 
shmorally should do what I shmorally should do. Okay, there are certain things that are prescribed by the shmoral standpoint. Um, so if I'm like, you know, if I, if when I ask the question, what should I do? If that question is being guided by the shmoral standpoint, um, and and then I say, well, you know, why should why should I care about what I shmorally ought to do? If the should there or the, and the ought is being guided by the shmoral standpoint, then again, it just becomes trivial. I shmorally ought to do what I shmorally ought to do. Um, you know, if I take the moral standpoint, I endorse the moral standpoint. If I take the shmoral standpoint, I endorse the shmoral standpoint. So you know, like if I'm wondering whether to endorse the moral standpoint, this trivial point doesn't really seem to help me. There's a second worry though, which is maybe the question that's really being asked here isn't quite as trivial as it seems. So, <clears throat> so this objection would say, well, the question isn't simply, why should I care about what's moral, right? Why should I do what's moral? The question is why should I care about the realist's conception of the moral facts? Why should I care about moral facts as conceived by the realist? So suppose, for instance, that we're considering non-naturalist moral realism. I can wonder, you know, okay, why should I care about patterns of non-natural properties? And it's it seems a, a rather shallow answer to say that, you know, I should care about such non-natural properties because it's simply in the nature of these properties that I morally should care about them. That, you know, this is just what it is to have such a property. I mean, consider again divine command theory. One way to take the euthyphro is that it seems to be part of the moral standpoint that actions cannot be good or bad merely in virtue of being commanded by God. Right, so so it's, you know, like, the, so the divine command theorist wants to say, well, like, morality... Um, is just kind of grounded in the commands of God. But then it, it seems to be part of the moral standpoint itself that something that's morally reprehensible like slavery can't be, can't become good, can't become acceptable merely on the say-so of, you know, some being, no matter how supreme that being might be. Um, now, we certainly can't solve that problem by just stipulating that you should care about God's commands because it's simply in the nature of God's commands that you morally should care about them. So, turning to moral realism then, you know, the, the, the question that's being raised by the Arbitrarianist Challenge is not simply, why should I care about morality? But why should I care about morality as morality is conceived of by the realist, right? Why should I care about the objective moral facts? And we might argue, well, it seems to be part of the moral standpoint that actions cannot be good or bad in virtue of having particular objective properties of the sort postulated by the realist. And again, to say simply that, well, if there are objective moral facts, it's just in the nature of such facts that you should care about them. Uh, that doesn't seem to address that worry. Um, so um, that's uh, what we might say about the first option. Let's consider the second option. So on the second option, um, conforming to the moral facts is justified from some other normative standpoint. Maybe, for instance, acting uh, in line with the objective moral facts promotes my self-interest, or acting in line with the objective moral facts is what is rationally required. So one worry about this is what we might call the coincidence objection. As many moral realists conceive of it, the moral standpoint is supposed to be independent from these other standpoints. Uh, for example, nothing guarantees that the moral rules will always promote your own self-interest. Indeed, acting morally often appears to require putting aside one's self-interest. Similarly, if we think of rationality in instrumental terms as choosing the best means for your ends, for instance, then nothing guarantees that acting morally will always be rationally optimal. Um, so, you know, we might think that if we argue that conforming to the moral facts is justified from some other normative standpoint, there's going to be a kind of remarkable coincidence here. Like, isn't it a remarkable coincidence if what is favoured by these other standpoints just happens to conform perfectly with the moral facts? Now, of course, that's probably going to depend on the exact details of the argument, right? Like, well, how exactly is it that the uh, uh, the, the, the moral standpoint is justified from these other standpoints? But this is one 
worry that might arise, right? Um, but there's only, so there's a deeper problem here though, which is suppose we can show that the moral moral standpoint is justified from one of these other standpoints, say the rational standpoint. So we're saying um, it is irrational to fail to follow the objective moral rules. Well, now as Cowell points out we can just raise uh, the question, the original question, that formed the arbitrariness challenge again. Why should I endorse these other standpoints? Why should I care about being rational? Um, just as we can come up with alternative codes of conduct to morality, we can come up with alternative norms to rationality. So, just for example, Maybe rationality requires me to choose the most effective means to my ends. Um, obviously, there's lots of different, you know, views about what exactly rationality consists in, but you know, let's just take one of them, right? So let's assume that rationality requires that I take the best means to my ends. But then there is schmationality, which requires merely that I choose reasonably good means to my ends. It requires that I choose adequate means to my ends, but there's no requirement that I aim for perfection. Okay, why should I follow the norms of rationality rather than the norms of schmationality? Um, here we have our original problem in a new form. Um, so any attempt we make to justify, you know, taking one of these normative standpoints it's either just going to be from the standpoint itself, which looks circular or trivial, or it's going to be from some other standpoint where the arbitrariness challenge is just going to re-arise. Um, a final possible response that Carroll discusses is that the realist might appeal to motivational internalism. According to motivational internalism, moral judgments are intrinsically motivating. When I judge that slavery is morally wrong, I just will have a motivation not to enslave people. When I judge that giving to charity is good, I will be motivated to give to charity. And this is what is special about the moral standpoint. We are naturally inclined to act in accordance with what we take the moral facts to be. So, you know, I'm asking, like, why should I care about the moral facts? Well, I just do care about the moral facts. It's just built into my psychological constitution. Um, I should note that uh, this move is perhaps a little bit desperate. So one issue with appealing to motivational internalism in this context is that motivational internalism is often taken to support anti-realism, particularly non-cognitivist positions. Um, I, uh, so you can check out my, uh, my video on non-cognitivism in my meta-ethics series. I talk a bit about that argument in there. But the point is, many philosophers think that there's actually a tension between motivational internalism and realism. So this might be a tricky move for the realist to make here. But um, put, let's put that aside. So um, if motivational internalism is true, then it is perhaps an interesting psychological thesis about human beings. But it's not really clear how this answers our question. Um, let's grant that there are moral facts. Let's grant that knowledge of the moral facts is somehow intrinsically motivating. I can still ask myself the question, well, like, why, why should I conform to them, right? Like, maybe, I, maybe in practice, it's just, like, I'm psychologically compelled to conform to them, right? Like, it's not... So, <clears throat> I can ask myself, like, you know, so maybe it's not psychologically possible for me to follow a different system... But I could still ask myself, like, you know, why, sh like, why shouldn't I, right? If I were able to, why shouldn't I? I mean, first of all, maybe I could work on it, right? Like, I might be able to train myself to be motivated by different norms. Or maybe technological developments will one day allow me to alter my brain so that I am motivated by different norms. Um, but, you know, certainly I can imagine hypothetical scenarios where... I am able to change my psychological dispositions, um, and then I can ask myself, well, why not? Why not do that? Um, and if te technology develops in the right kind of way, these scenarios might even become real, at which point I will face a choice, right? I, I can continue to uh, follow what I recognise the objective moral norms to be, or I can change myself. 
so that I have exactly the same beliefs about what the objective moral norms are, but I follow some, some different normative system. Um, in any case, there is a more serious problem with appealing to motivational internalism here. Um, so again, grant that the moral facts are intrinsically motivating, well, clearly their motivational power is extremely limited. People often fail to do what they believe they ought to do. People have all kinds of motivations. Um, we don't always have moral rules in mind, uh, even if we're moral realists who are very concerned about morality. So the situation is this. I find myself somewhat motivated by what I believe to be the moral facts, but I have many other motivations as well, which sometimes conflict with what I think I morally ought to do. Now, I could decide to endorse the moral standpoint and make a greater effort to conform to the moral rules, or not. Um, <clears throat> now, if I, if I choose not to endorse the moral standpoint, and motivational internalism is true, I'm still going to feel some motivation to conform to the moral rules. Uh, but, you know, I mean, okay. Um, but I, I, I still don't endorse that, that particular standpoint, right? Like, I'm not, going to be let my, let my, I'm not going to let myself be too troubled by uh, failing to act on that motivation. Um, so motivational internalism maybe would show that there's something special about the moral facts, right? Or at least by what we take the moral facts to be. Um, there's something special about our moral beliefs in, in that they have this motivating power um, but it doesn't seem, again, it's a kind of uh, distinctiveness that doesn't seem to uh, address the arbitrariness challenge. Um, okay, well, that was the, uh, the arbitrariness challenge. I hope you found that interesting. I will um, see you in the next video. Bye, everybody.